So let's start the event. Um, I'll just note that we have a hashtag, which is hashtag time three. I think we're going uh, live online as well. Of course, it's with enormous personal pleasure as well as intellectual pleasure that I can introduce uh, Irun Kavitsain and uh, to give our opening talk today on narratives in medical writing 1500 to 1800, though I noticed 1375 was correct, in, which is great. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. And first of all, I would like to uh, thank for the opportunity to come here, come here and, and it's a great, great event and we are all very happy that you are organizing it now after four years. So thank you very much. And it's my pleasure to start this conference. And I'm going to talk about medical narratives in a diachronic perspective. So from the beginning of, of vernacular English medical writing uh, to the modern, modern, late modern period, but my focus will be on post 1500. And I start with, with narrative definition. definition. And so narratives have been defined as a series of temporarily ordered events with action recording sentences. And that means, means that that sort of narrative concerns are often expressed with past tense, perfect aspect, third person pronouns and so on. And now lately there has been talk, talk about a narrative turn taking place which means that, that the field has broadened from literary text to, to interdisciplinary studies, oral interaction, written non-literary texts, situated institutional communication, narratives of personal experience and so on. And my talk pertains to this narrative turn. And my approach is that of social historical pragmatics meaning that I will uh, discuss multi-layered contexts from narrow context to period background and all in, com in comparing worldview use. Societal and cultural developments uh, between past uh, text participants with their social linguistic parameters are in focus. Focus and I also discuss how narratives are tied and reflect underlying thought styles. Health issues are of course of concern to all and the authors range of these texts range from medical practitioners, from university educated doctors to trained professionals and here's a list of them and less educated medical men empirics, quacks, laity and women. And I noticed that women feature quite strongly in this conference Conference here. And audiences vary as well. It, the, same, the range is about the same. And the general public and households with women, they are important, important too. The method, method, so uh, qualitative discourse analysis here. So I quote some examples, but fairly short ones. But at the background, I have quantitative studies, studies uh, combining digital humanities with medical history and discourse analysis. And this is what I did together with Gerald Schneider and published in a recent book. And social historical facts of texts are given in our corpus, corpus so the data comes mostly from our, our corpora. And I start with natural narratology, natural narratives. And here is how Michael Toulan, Toulan so, sort of formulated uh, Glabov's and Valetsky's scheme. So the abstract first, first, what is the story about? Then orientation, who, when, where, complicating action, evaluation, so what? Why is this interesting? And result or resolution, what finally happened? And CODA, that's it. I'm going on about other things. And then now recently, Monika Flodernik from Freiburg has, has sort of launched 
a project of diachronic narratology. And I'm sort of uh, part of, partly sort of part of it, consultant. And uh, so, so both literary and non-literary texts text are included there. Monica mentions history writing, writing, and this medical medical sort of narratives are connected to. The method there is focus is language analysis with features signal, signaling discourse structures, a structure and effect and so on. So here's a list list of some of the features that her project pays attention to. And I'll start with the early period, as I promised. Promised. So, so uh, in the medieval medieval times, 1375 is mentioned as the early date date when the first vernacular writings em emerged emerged and they are mostly mostly sort of recipes the early ones and then in in this period case studies anecdotes and biblical narratives are important instruction in latin had an effect on vernacular writing too but of course case studies were connected with university medicine medicine and in the vernacular they are mostly for efficacy purposes or boosting the writer's ego as with John Arden's case in John Arden's case and the thought style was scholasticism with absolute reliance on authorities and deontic modalities and here's here's a lot of scholastic features were transferred into the vernacular and I have a very short example here, here from an early recipe. So we have, have and I saw therefore a certain receipt made for pestilence that came from the masters of Cologne. So that's the authorities and, and Lyons mentioned there. And then deontic modality should be made. And then this is a very, very simple, simple example. But now I move to the new world or to, to the early modern period. And there are there are two different important important developments. And first of all, in the 16th century, the earlier trends continue, but there was a new fashion to write medical texts in a dialogic mode mode. This was particularly in surgical textbooks. <coughs> And they were for teaching, but then, then sort so of these frames were taken from literary, literary sort of writings. Chaucer's influence can be seen there, there, and fictional elements. And well, we'll see how it is. And empirical experience and knowledge was emphasized in the surgical texts. But so the this was a very strong trend, and it continued. But actually, observation started to be enhanced from the 17th, 16th century on, and the Royal Society period, 1662, changed, changed the scene as the philosophical transactions created a new genre at the top, top the empirical essay, essays. They were narratives of doing science. science according to the principles of the new science and it was the thought style was empiricism based on observation but first about the teaching dialogues that were earlier earlier so several traditions come together in them then especially in the frame narratives but because then what ensues is this professional dialogue often often sort of modeled according to to the classical classical pattern questions and answers Guido Scholiak, Guido's questions and so on they were a very strong trend trend there and here's so sort of what the what the uh, teaching dialogues had as frame story stories because they crossed the border between fiction and non-fiction, 
Uh, they depict the countryside in a beautiful May morning, uh, the surgeons roaming there and starting professional discussion uh, about all important issues. And here's an example from Thomas Gale, 1563. And very rhetorical, rhetorical and uh, sort of fictional Phoebus who casteth away the dark and uncomfortable night, casting his golden beams on my face would not suffer me to take any longer sleep. So this is this is the dream poetry pattern, pattern from medieval medieval times. And then the depiction, the description of the scenery, May morning is a classical site, site sort of there. Then another other tradition is that of wisdom literature. And they, the preface of William Boulay's text mentioned that this is both pleasant and profitable to the industrious reader, reduced into the form of a dialogue, dialogue for the better understanding of the unlearned. And this is again just a conventional figure. It was mainly for professional readers, but as it is a health book, it had a wider circula circulation. And the, the participants are stereotypical, a foolish youngster and a wise old man. And this is how it goes in 1559. John is the is sort of the young man. Uh, Starting, starting the dialogue of all pleasures and pastime, me think there is none like unto good cheer. What should a man do but pass away the time uh, with good fellows and make merry and so on? He goes about all kinds of pleasures. And then Humphrey is here, starts to scorn him. I know well your goodly expense of time. I wish it is no marvel, although you make your belly your god and boast of it and so on. This is a conflict talk in a fairly sort of mild mode, mode but then it changes and, and becomes constructive and pleasant dialogue with entertaining songs, songs and, and so, sort of, and it, it's quite, quite a nice nice piece. But the Royal Society uh, established in 1662 changed the scene in the upper layers. This was the highest professional professional uh, sort, sort of layer layer and the advent of the new science can be has been traditionally counted to start then, but there were where some texts already earlier that enhanced the same things, things and the, the principle behind new science was the matter of fact. Everybody could verify what was happening, although the courses could be debated. And then experimental essays, I already mentioned them. They were to meet the new criteria of new science. So uh, replicability and objectivity. Experiments were conducted in front of gentlemen scientists at Royal Society meetings. And this means that, that it was not only medical doctors or doctors who attended this, but architects took part in the discussion and everybody. So gentlemen scientists this were there. And now the efficacy part, part was also had become different. So yes, so, so eyewitnesses names were given there for efficacy. And here you see the linguistic features, the first person singular and uh, sort of hesitation, could I uh, and so on. So very different, the mode is not absolute reliance anymore. Then coming to the dark side here, here, there were narratives connected with special diseases, the sweating sickness, John Keyes, but then pestilence inspired a lot of, lot of literature, William Boulay's uh, dialogue is famous, and this is from Thomas Nash's The Unfortunate Traveller. Traveller and the narrative unfolds, so it fell out that 
And then there entered such a hot spurt playing. Very nice narrative design here, here and dramatic turns, turns so it's quite vivid. But now I'm going to turn to the more private sphere, but plague continues there too. So here's Samuel Pepys diary, diary records London pestilence with affective terms, with exclamations, uh, historical present, uh, didactic shifts, this, this and that quite vivid. And there you see, see so pious wish God send it and so on, so on. Uh, ego narratives con con then continue with Daniel Defoe's journal of the plague year, the most famous uh, plague book, book perhaps, perhaps, and again the same applies, vivid narration, and this is fiction. Now I have a couple of minutes for the late modern period, period, but their case studies become central again, but not as before, not single cases, but put together with multiple case studies uh, doing science, and that little by little changed the thought style to, towards probabilities. Ego narratives, tra travelogues, uh, newsletters, so they continued. So, but this is the background that we, we sort of saw, saw, found out by this large scale study. study. There was a development towards increasing professionalization and, and organized medical practice that could be seen in the institutions. And specialized medical journals, journals were established and growing interest in welfare, philanthropic ideas, and the thought style, what we called it inquiry, as there were several trends competing with one another, not anymore, just one. And case studies were there at the uh, cutting edge science, science and inoculation controversy. I promised Elaine that I mentioned, mentioned it here. So there were arguments against on religious and patriotic grounds. And, and sort of arguments pros, pro with statistical evidence. This is from James Durin, and there you see in bold how he argued on statistical grounds. This is the first that I've seen. seen. There were then narratives for other purposes, anecdotes run through, and these ane anecdotes were often connected with medical history. And this is, for example, of Sir Walter Raleigh. Raleigh, a servant saw, saw him smoking, smoking and cried out, but threw a bowl of water on him and said, help, sir. Sir Walter has studied till his head's on fire and the smoke bursts out of his mouth and nose. So this is again jests and uh, Chaucer's Fabio and so on. Then another narrative, Lady Mont Montague, so this is in the fairy tale mode, mode and, and sort of the gentleman's magazine published this quite often, often, and then correspondence became important. Important medicine by post changed the way way so, sort of, of communication, and it also also so, sort of gave birth to new medical rhetoric that became common in fiction and in novels, for instance, later. So this is a survey, survey of the same things, the same same sort of slides that I had earlier. But then what we have what is good to remember here that by the side of these professional developments, there was this vast literature for, for wide and heterogeneous audiences. And it was for instruction and entertainment and use newspapers dealt with medical topics as well. The gentleman's magazine was important in the 18th century, pamphlets, and they all played an important role in promoting public knowledge on medical issues 
and enhancing historical awareness. And so thank you. I had to hurry, sorry, sorry, I took too long at the beginning. <laughs> so. Are there any questions? I can certainly start with them. Um, very interesting, the introduction of dialogue, and that made me think of the general theme of the impetus or the uh, grounds for innovation. Why do people shift the different ways in which they're using that uh, narrative in this case? Mm. So dialogue is an interesting one, of course, because it shifts from a narrative constructed by one author to a narrative constructed by one author that appears to be a co-constructed dialogue <laughs> between two fictional characters in yeah. that book. So do you have any sense of what sort of drove along that innovation? Was it borrowing from philosophy? Does it suggest a dominance or a shift of uh, researchers from philosophy into science? Any observations on that? I have sort of looked at medieval dialogues too. For example, there were health, health guides guides and with this this sort of conventional trope for the poor people people and uh, sometimes they have characters too there's one that has characters but mostly they are just marked question answer yeah. and that comes from the classical model yeah. Yeah. but i don't know i have i think that it's a, it's an innovation of the 16th century and then all of a sudden they are they are quite a, so for example william Boulain, i showed the wisdom literature piece but the fever pestilence dialogue is is quite remarkable yeah. to it's a it's a social satire yeah. so it makes it brings in even more trends yeah trends whether one way to approach it might be to look at the data from the point of view of authors and say, what also is this author writing? Mm. Or what have they written? So are they principally starting off in one genre, uh, expressing one type of knowledge and then bringing over another genre because they're coming from that tradition? Mm. So it might be interesting to look at it from the lens of the author into the corpus and say- what That's a good idea. Yes, I'll certainly yeah. mark that down. <laughs> so, thank you. I've got another one if nobody has that. I'm totally agree with Ellen. <laughs> was there ever any resistance to the use of narrative in new genres? Because, you know, whenever some innovation is brought in, then people are critical of people, the novel, et cetera, et cetera. So did you find any evidence people had to justify using a narrative uh, mode in, in places where it wasn't used before? Uh, perhaps this conventional trope, this this for the benefit of the unlearned. Perhaps it is an excuse for using using this this mode mode. But no, I haven't. I think that it was accepted, and it was so, sort of. Uh, it actually made the instruction easier and and had a real function of spreading knowledge, as health issues are important to all, and so that was or something and also in in the 18th century in the gentleman's magazine there's a lot lots of sort of medical things in the correspondence in the narratives and justifying and instructing at the same time yeah please but um, what I found very interesting is the the concept of efficacy and its connection to anecdotes as proofs of efficacy because it reminded me a lot of the use of historiole in ancient rituals, mm -hmm. where efficacy of a treatment is created by the story, by giving an example, so that the only efficacy mechanism. And do you have the impression that there's a development too in, in, in the view that efficacy of a treatment, like a medical treatment, is already there and you have to promote it or you have to persuade someone by using the anecdote. The, uh... In the, in the middle middle ages that trend is very strong and it's sort of, sort of i had first a quotation from john arden but i skipped it it would have taken too long but he's sort of boasting i healed all that everybody had tried but they couldn't i could my medicine was so good and my treatment was so good so that goes out out then and i think that is connected with this mode as somebody's going to talk about the, this later sort of how 
how sort of from personal to impersonal personal. So that already starts there. So it's not anymore anymore. So but even in the in the 19th century, we have case studies where the two modes modes sort of personal and impersonal and narratives of the doctor and narrative narrative of the patient intertwine. For example, there in case studies, the doctor said that I felt awful. I was astonished to see this patient and so on, telling so, sort of the looks of the patient and what was something that out of the question question in more modern medicine. Another interesting thing, of course, that the narrative work that you're uh, looking at introduces is to some extent um, a well, sort of social actor dimension, I think, was in there. So you talked about the writer and the audience. So already you have some type of construction of knowledge that mm. the person saying, I have the authority to write yes. this, you should want to read it. And I could see that sort of echoed in some of the examples you gave. But also I was then very interested again in the dialogues, because of course in the, you gave a very nice example showing who has the knowledge. So mm. it's a person of wisdom imparting yeah. it to a young yeah. boy. So yeah, I was exactly. interested firstly in whether or not you see the sort of construction of the possession of knowledge within your dialogues, i.e. Mean, social roles being associated with licensed knowledge. That would be one point. But the second point might be to say, if you then look at them as narratives, do you see subparts of the narratives associated with different types of actors? So say, for example, if you're the wise man, do you have the warrant to introduce the complicating action? Or if you're the wise man, do you have the warrant to introduce the resolution? So you'd actually see those narratives splitting across social worlds. I didn't see the complicating action so much in the dialogues, but it was very clear always in these case studies, because there sort of it is an essential point. But authorizing knowledge and negotiating it and and the the learner become becoming wiser and accepting it that happens for example in william boulain's talk so so they construct the knowledge or at the end they both praise praise how good it is to obey these health rules and so on and i think that this this sort of a health guide guide genre has quite a lot of interaction all through, though not in a dialogue form as such. Great, and a useful reminder in this discussion of the power of the anecdote, mm. uh, which I think actually will probably come back to home to the next couple of days. There's very powerful things. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Gina. Thank you. Thank you.